What if I told you that the CIA could have in part been behind the global explosion of punk rock? It might sound crazy, but a number of new wave and punk bands in the 70s and 80s thought that this could be the case. Now, why did some of them think this? Well, it's because the most prolific manager and business mind in the history of punk rock, Miles Copeland III of IRS Records and Faulty Products, a man known for helping launch the musical careers of groups like the Sex Pistols, the Dead Kennedys, the Cramps, R.E.M. and the Police, was the son of Miles Copeland Jr., the far-right co-founder of the CIA and a lifelong intelligence operative. That's right. The man behind the CIA and countless coups the world over was the man behind the man who masterminded so much of punk rock's golden era. He's also the man behind his brothers as well. The late Ian Copeland of Frontier Booking International, FBI for short, punk's premier booking agency at the time, and Stuart Copeland, the drummer for the police, at one time, the biggest band in the world. Now to some, three sons of intelligence operatives all going into the punk rock business might seem like a totally normal act of rebellion. And maybe it was just that, but at the very least, it's a bit suspect. It's not like Miles in particular was keen on rebelling against his infamous father either. Much to the contrary, he allegedly paid his dad a stipend to do work for him for years, including while he was running IRS records and faulty products. So forgivably, a number of musicians were suspicious of his father's potential involvement and influence over their music careers. But don't take it from me, take it from Jello Biafra, singer of the Dead Kennedys. And hell, don't take it from Jello, take it from Miles himself. I've had acts that have thought that I was a CIA front. I almost signed X, actually. I don't know if you know the group X during the punk days. And the ba the, it was the guitar player what gave me always had this weird look at me and it finally came out you know i know you're a ci front you're trying to find what youth are doing <laughs> what? <laughs> really they thought mm -hmm. i was ca and as miles would admit in this same interview it wasn't just punk rock bands or crackpot musicians who thought he was working for the cia there were cia agents who thought he could be working for the cia as well going back to his college years in lebanon as a prank i used to answer my phone cia but it got to the local CIA agent who uh, then called me up. He thought I was CIA, you know, and it was very embarrassing. But anyway. And when you couple that with some intentionally shady comments in a 1986 Rolling Stone interview by Miles Copeland Jr. on his son's success in the music business, the lens becomes more sinister and distorted. Now, to the Copeland's credit, they never really hid their background or who their father was. All three of them seem to be very open about it, actually. And Miles III especially seems to be open about who he is. And because of that, I'm not 100% ready to believe that IRS Records and Faulty Products brand of New Wave and Punk were the result of some CIA cultural influence operation. Even though, again, that has been previously alleged against Copeland by bands he worked with and tried to sign. Musicians can be very wacky and very suspicious, you know. Mm. It's worth considering, too, that some of the more radical and diametrically opposed bands that Miles would sign, like, for example, the Dead Kennedys or the Cramps, would both encounter serious issues while working with Miles and IRS. In the case of the Dead Kennedys, they were signed by IRS Records with the promise of distribution through A&M Records, the third largest distributor in the music industry at the time. However, their debut album, Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables, would have its distribution limited due to objections over their band name by Jerry Moss, the head of A&M Records, the parent company of IRS, due to his close friendship with the Kennedy family. Now, I'm sure that Miles was shocked when this happened and didn't foresee this at all when he signed them. And in the case of the Cramps, one of the wildest and least conservative rock and roll bands in history, Miles shockingly loved them. But apparently the Cramps never fully loved him back and were suspicious of his intense interest and involvement in their band. This would result in a number of clashes between IRS records and the cramps, which would ultimately culminate in a years long legal battle that almost killed the band. And if the book Walking on the Moon is to be believed, this was all a very deliberate and personal attempt by Miles Copeland to crush the band at the height of their popularity. But still, it's hard for me to believe that this was a part of some big official CIA cultural influence operation. And I also say that in spite of Miles III, 
literally being recruited by the Department of Defense for advice on implementing cultural influence campaigns. So I get a call from Donald Rumsfeld. My secretary comes up to me and says, Miles, it's Donald Rumsfeld on the phone. I go, yeah, 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 sure. You know, so I pick up the phone, you know, thinking this is a joke. And it's uh, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Tori Clark. And she says, uh, we hear that you know about our music and we think there might be a way to win hearts and minds in the Middle East. And would you help us come up with some programs that uh, we might do and put forward that helps us, you know, make the Rockies not hate us? You know? well, I said, well, sure, you know, I'm a loyal American. I'm happy to help. The plan is to find 12 girls who will be the basis of a, of a show featuring uh, Arab dance and Arab music. Now, this could be very well true, but when you consider the police's meteoric rise to fame and Miles' on-time status as a punk rock tastemaker, it's really hard not to raise an eyebrow at this. And then there's the police's admittedly strange touring patterns early on. Take, for example, when Miles made the decision for the police to tour the U.S. for the first time in the late 70s. Miles, in a very short period of time, essentially moved the band overseas from the U.K. to New York City without a real tour or any actual shows in place, with the idea being that they would book shows while they were living in New York City amongst the punk rock scene. Things get even weirder on their first tour in 1980 in support of their first hit single, Roxanne. The booking strategy, again, could be it was considered strange by some. The tour started in Japan in February 1980, where the group and rock music in general already had a keen following. Unknown Territory in Hong Kong followed, where they played in front of just 50 people in a club. That didn't matter to Sting, as he later explained in his own inimitable fashion. You have to stay hungry at the same time as you've earned a massive fortune. That is why the band are doing things that are strange, like playing to 50 people in Hong Kong. And as Jello pointed out earlier, and Copeland himself later admitted, on the same breakout tour in 1980 where this Hong Kong show with 50 people took place, there were also police shows happening in countries like Egypt and India, which at the time weren't exactly tour friendly for Western bands, and in some cases were actively embroiled in geopolitical turmoil when the police were scheduled to play there. You might be asking yourself, why would the police tour these countries that weren't set up at the time for international touring on their all important first world tour? The better question is, how did they tour these places? Well, the answer is Miles admittedly did in fact have to call on help from his father and his intelligence contacts to make sure the police's shows on this tour went off without a hitch. And am I right in saying that you maybe made a phone call to your dad? Well, we've had a couple of situations. I mean, we were in Cairo and we couldn't get the equipment out of the, the customs, you know, because it, it, it came in air freight as opposed to excess baggage. You know, I said, ah, well, I do know this guy, Hassan Tuhani. He is the <laughs> vice prime minister of Egypt. <laughs> and lo and behold, I talked to him and he said, oh, hey, Miles, how are you? How's your father? How's your mother? You know, how's everything? What can I do for you? You know, and I said, well, uh, I got this problem at the airport. I got my equipment stuck. He says, don't worry, one minute. And about three seconds later, these sirens are wailing and 30 policemen show up and wave the equipment through. And I turn to the band and I say, that's management. And speaking of Sting, after the police disbanded, Miles would continue to manage him during his solo career. And one of the more interesting alleged events from this later era is detailed in the 1996 biography, Sting. The story goes that when Sting was on his 1987-88 solo tour, the Brazilian government actually put a spy on Sting's tour crew in response to Sting's newfound interest in the preservation of the Brazilian rainforest. Now here's where it gets really weird. The spy in question allegedly believed that Sting himself could be a CIA agent. According to the book Sting, the notes of this spy would later be discovered by Sting and his team, with the spy subsequently and unceremoniously being kicked off the tour because of it. While this is shocking, the suspicions of a bumbling Brazilian spy is in reality proof of nothing. But at the very least, the fact that this was allegedly found in the notes of a Brazilian spy is interesting. Even if the idea of Sting being a CIA agent himself 
is objectively hilarious. It's a cause for the whole of the people of Brazil. There's also the comical case of Copeland helping manage Steven Seagal's music career during his Mojo Priest era. While there's nothing to say that there was anything amiss about this pairing, it can seem a bit odd when you remember that for years, Seagal himself would imply that he worked with the CIA and then was publicly discredited for the claims. Also, it's worth noting that in years prior to working with Copeland, Seagal was bogged down in a court battle with some of his former business associates. Business associates who had serious ties to organized crime. Even more, Seagal had now testified against these men and would be in fear for his life. You know, it was just one of those funny things. And he hands me these 45s and, and I'm going like, well, what am I supposed to do with these guns? You know, he said, well, you know, you got to protect yourself, you know. So it was it was an amusing, you know, we have a lot. There were, you know, believe me, in, in my lifetime working with rock and roll stars, there were a lot of funny stories, you know. Now, I'm not saying anything is off about Copeland and Seagal working together. But when you consider the CIA's own history with the mob as well, it again, at the very least, is interesting to think about. All in all, these are very fantastical stories, and it's really hard to know what to believe, and a lot of that is by design. But that is also the part that makes me wonder the most. Maybe in the 70s, Miles Copeland was working for the CIA on a punk rock cultural influence campaign. I don't know. And I still on a level doubt it because it just seems so crazy to me. But crazier things have been alleged. And on that note, I am reminded of a very popular podcast and upcoming documentary called Wind of Change from Crooked Media. Wind of Change effectively alleges that the CIA hired songwriters to compose the song Wind of Change by the Scorpions during the Cold War. This podcast also includes the allegation that in the 1980s, the CIA saw rock music as a cultural weapon. What's really interesting, again, is that is exactly how Miles saw rock and roll himself. But before I go too deep on that and get conspiratorial, the most I can truly say is that Miles admittedly did want to follow in his father's footsteps as a CIA agent. And if he is to be believed, his father discouraged him from doing so, and he didn't join. This quote comes from an interview with Miles in 2021. I thought about it, joining the CIA at one point, but my father talked me out of it because he said the reality is things have changed. They don't care about what you think. They care about you saying the right things for whatever the political agenda is at the time. You're going to think that's a lot of crap and you're going to be unhappy. In reality, Miles didn't need to officially work for the CIA because by the time he went into music, his father was already running a private intelligence agency that worked alongside the CIA. I would assume also that the CIA probably wouldn't have greenlit or funded such an absurd operation themselves in the late 70s. But I also wouldn't doubt that it didn't possibly have the CIA's blessing in a way. To that end, it seems like IRS and faulty products were more of a passion project of an extremely politically ambitious Miles Copeland. And that passion project of course comes with all the influence, support, and connections that go along with being the son of a CIA co-founder. So with that, we will probably never know how much, if at all, the CIA directly influenced the spread and growth of New Wave and Punk, or to what extent Miles Copeland was involved with the global intelligence community during that time. But if you absolutely want to say that Punk was the result of a cultural influence campaign, it would be most accurate to say, in my opinion, that the campaign came from Miles Copeland III himself and not the CIA. More than anything, it seems like Miles was a true believer in the power of rock and roll as a means of cultural and political change during the Cold War. And perhaps no one in American history believed in its ability for that more than Miles. One thing is for sure though, Miles Copeland is one of the most mysterious and fascinating figures in the annals of popular music. And like pretty much everything else with this story, a lot of that again is by his own design. Thanks for watching.